Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer podcast, brought to you by Rocket Agency. I'm your host, James Lawrence. Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer podcast. Today, I am here with David Lawrence, co-founder of Rocket, and also my much, much, much younger brother. <laughs> Dave, how's mum? Mum's great. She says to say hi. She's good, dad? Yeah, perfect. That's perfect. That's- Good to hear. So we are today going to discuss how much you should be paying for a digital agency. We we're talking before the pod that um, we're going to we're going to try to lift up the hood of the car. We're going to try to give as much value as possible. We're not going to say it depends. We're not going to say we won't talk about how much we charge. We're going to try to be as transparent as possible. Um, so, Dave, we thought the best possible place to start is just to talk bigger picture, just different ways of of paying an agency, different models, how arrangements can be structured. Mm. Yeah, it's such an interesting topic. It's it's interesting. Agencies have been around forever, obviously, and and I think for as long as agencies have been around, there's been different ways that that they've priced themselves and different ways that clients have wanted it to be priced. And I'm not sure anything's changed um, dramatically in recent years, but, but I think digital agencies definitely have some flexibility. Yeah, pricing model. So, the first thing I'll say is I'm going to say it depends a few times today. Um, I, I think it's a legitimate, um, legitimate answer to the question because the, the thing about marketing is it's not a commodity, and, and anyone listening to this podcast knows that that you don't go out to a shop and buy yourself some marketing. Marketing's um, should always be a custom service which is designed to solve a business problem. Yep. Um, from my perspective, it's not just about creating beautiful things. It's, it's not about getting seen. It's about a company saying, what do we need to achieve as a business and how can marketing help us get there? So when someone says to me, what's the cost of a digital agency or a particular campaign or a project, um, my, my first instinct is always to say, well, what's the problem that's being solved? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if that's a bit of an it depends kind of start. I'm going to push you harder. We, I'm going to get actual numbers out of you. You will get, I, I promise you, you'll get, absolute, you'll get actual numbers um, in terms of ranges and, and that sort of stuff. But, yeah. but I just think that's an important thing to set the tone as, which is um, if you go out looking for a cookie cutter price um, and if you find an agency that has a cookie cutter price, so a clear list of prices, these are our four services and this is what we charge for them all, irrespective of who the client is, um, then you shouldn't be surprised when you get a cookie cutter solution. And you know what? For some clients, that's going to work brilliantly. If you happen to need what they happen to sell off the shelf, um, then that may well be the right approach for you. Um, and you could jump online right now and find a bunch of agencies that'll tell you exactly what they'll charge. But I think for most of the people listening to this pod, um, in-house marketers facing genuine challenges in a pretty tough market, the, the problem they're trying to solve um, is custom. It's, it's unique to them. So how do you do it? If you're an in-house marketer and you, you're aware of what your problem is, it's only to generate this number of leads or this any online sales, yep. you feel that... Google is maybe the way to do it or Facebook or LinkedIn, yep. you reach out to an agency. What are the different models? Like how, how can an agency charge you? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So let's go through some of the really common ones you're seeing yep. in the Australian marketplace at the moment. Um, probably the most common one is a, sort of a retainer model where you're, you're basically going to be charged a flat fee per month for that particular channel. So um, the, the agency is likely just to go, right, we need, $3,000 or $5,000 or $7,000 or $10,000 or $50,000 a month to run your Google Ads campaign. And, and that price it might be based on some internal parameters that they have in the agency, but they're going to be very much looking at your campaign and they're going to want to um, have best educated guess about the sort of effort that's required to get a result. So with that kind of retainer approach, if it is Google Ads, um, you're expecting the agency to want to get into your Google Ads um, campaign itself and see what's involved, see what the scope for improvement is and what ongoing maintenance can look like. That's kind of how we at Rocket Charge, pretty much all of our engagements, are. Yep. we hopefully do a diagnostic before working with a client. Yep, we've identified that this is the channel or the channels we should be working in. Yep. Google Ads, SEO, pretty yep. common, for instance. Yep. And for the, you know, we're going to charge you X for SEO and Y for Google Ads. This is the scope. Work together for six months, reset the strategy, work together, monthly reports. QBRs, whips, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. And, and the retainer model is an interesting one. It's not without its flaws, of course, but it, it's sort of trying to align the risk somewhere between both parties. So the agency is looking at it and saying, we think there's this amount, this amount of work that's required to, 
to achieve the results that have been discussed and you know, peg that at a certain price. Um, and equally, the client um, is taking a risk as well in, in whether they're being overcharged or, or all the rest of it. But usually time will tell. And, and as you just suggested, typically with the retainer model, you have resets. Some agencies are quarterly, some every six months, some are yearly, but there'll be a reset to make sure that, that the scope was correct and that it's working for both parties. Then the next kind of the next model that could be out there in the marketplace? Yeah, so the next one's a bit of a hybrid or it can be standalone. The next one's a percentage of media. Um, so often if you have an agency, particularly in the in the paid ads space, um, they're gonna they're gonna charge their retainer and they'll also, if you go over a certain amount of media, they'll charge a percentage of the media. And that's because typically the more money that's having to be spent on the ad campaigns, the more work that's being done by specialists within the agency. So pretty common um, to see an agency that has a, a flat retainer fee plus 10% of media spend over a certain amount of money. Um, yeah. That'll depend on the size of the return. And that percentage floats, right? Like I think we, that's probably the second most common way that we'll be charging our clients where it's a yeah. certain amount of money for, if it is a channel with media in it and yep. manage a certain amount of media. And I think and maybe to jump in here, so often clients who are more accustomed to offline media buying, TV, um, traditional newspaper, billboards, whatever it might be, digital is different where generally agencies like us don't get a markup or a commission. So if we don't get a kickback from Facebook, don't get a kickback from Google, yep. the way we make money is through the retainer plus the media management, um, yeah. where I think a lot of the time we'll come up with in-house marketers are saying, well, that's ridiculous. Why are you charging 15% or 10% or whatever it might be? And it's well, you actually generally, that commission or markup, you're paying a lot more for other media. You just don't see it because it's, it's built into the media buy. Um, yeah. And I think the other element of digital there is often we'll find clients that have come from programmatic and different platforms where there's a hidden markup or a hidden commission that the agency is getting where so then there is no media management fee or quite a small one because there's actually a much higher percentage being built in. So you're actually not buying the media you think you're buying. Um, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And it sort of goes to the question of transparency. Um for, for clients, doesn't it? Just to throw back to a story, way back in my career, I, I did some freelance work um, to, an, to an ad agency back in the in the good old days when it came to to uh, commissions as the way for agencies to earn money. And yeah. back then, this was a traditional agency, and and they charged lots of money for services, plus seventeen and a half percent of everything they did. Um, and and it literally was a license to print money for agencies. So yeah, if you're working with a digital agency nowadays, you should be expecting true transparency and accountability. Um, you have every right to understand where they're making their money. And, and as you say, if, if, they're, if the money's being spent in sort of standard, you know, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn type channels, then um, the money that goes to those organisations should be going there completely. That's it. And I think then, then the flip side to that is be realistic, which is if you're spending 100K a month on media and you're expecting a digital agency to run it at 5%, that's 5K a month. Yep. You divide that by your, your four weeks in the month and you've got you know, 1200 bucks a week and you're paying a couple of hundred bucks for someone's time. Yep. Do you really, do you really, is it realistic that six hours of someone's time is going to be enough to properly manage 100K? So work with your agency on what's the amount of time resourcing that's going to allow them to make awesome decisions, be in the tools, split testing, bringing creative in, whatever it might be. And you'll yeah. actually find that your 100K goes a lot, lot further. Um, so I guess the next the next model, so we've kind of got flat retainer, then we've got a retainer plus a percentage of spend, the next model that an agency could be charging. Yeah, can, can I say one thing? And I don't want this to come across as self-serving for agencies, um, but something that, that has frustrated me a little bit in the past has been when clients grow their media spend and they start to deeply resent the media yep. percentage. And, and I've seen clients say, well, we're now spending $150,000 a month on media. We've decided to bring it all in-house and give it to one paid search specialist that they've employed. And they see that as a saving. They'll say, well, you know, we've been paying 8% or 9% of all of our media. It's cheaper to put someone in house. And, and I, I find that quite frustrating because the, the skills that are required to execute brilliantly on campaigns are really complex nowadays and involve lots of people. So um, I sort of encourage people when they're thinking about what they're spending on media to understand exactly how much work is going in to scaling up that media spend, not just with a paid specialist, but with strategists and creatives and writers and all the extra people that agencies, good agencies tend to bring in um, if they're earning their money off a media percentage. That comes back to your point before, which is look at what problem you're trying to solve. 100%. You know, we're trying to solve this problem and this is the bucket of money. It doesn't really matter if it 
a larger percentage is going to the agency and a smaller percentage into Google and Facebook, as long as the actual outcome itself is, is better. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's up to the in-house marketers um, themselves to be able to understand the value and to sell it to stakeholders within their company. So don't, don't think about the, and again, I don't want this to sound self-serving, self-serving, don't think about um, the total you're spending, think about the results you're getting. It's just true though. The problem is, is often non-marketers are accustomed to well, we used to buy the billboard by the airport. We used to yep. buy the full page ad in the Fin Review, and there was no there was no media fee or a very small one, yep. without actually realizing that it was all baked in. So yeah, that's it. And I think in that environment, that the the cheaper you can get the billboard, the better. The billboard doesn't become less good because you spent less money on it. So mm. I think for particularly um, non marketers or, or people that have come from that traditional media background, it's all about negotiating down the price you pay. Um, for the placement, and that doesn't necessarily translate well to digital, where you're dealing with quite skilled people who are trying to achieve um, something. Well, it's actually the complete opposite, which is the way to drill down the price is by having awesome people optimizing the campaign so that you get better reach or better results. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But um, yeah, so the next model, um, there's a there's a really simple model that yeah, it's probably not that popular, but you definitely come across it, which is purely an hourly rate model. So um, and this will probably um, you see this working sometimes at sort of, um, I, I guess the top end of town sometimes does this approach where they want some transparency on their retainer and you see it from very small companies or even sole practitioners where they're purely going on hourly rate. Um, again, it, it's a model that's out there, um, not great for predictability of expenses sometimes for the client, but uh, yeah, it's a model that's out there. Gov- some government work, I guess, gets done that way as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Why don't we do, why don't we do that as a business? Um, we don't do it as a business just because we like to be focused on the business problem itself. Um, we like to know that there'll be some months that we go way over in our commitment. This is why the retainer model works well for us and our clients. We'll go way over in the commitment some months and, and we might go under some months and we'll try to balance it out over the six months or 12 months life of, of that agreed campaign. Um, we find the hourly rate conversation. It does a couple of things. First of all, it focuses the client on the number of hours that are being used. Um, and it's always easy to find um, what can be perceived as wastage because the, the path to success with marketing is not always a straight kind of journey. Um, we might need to spend more money in, in design or in an element of coding or a particular specialist on a channel or strategy, depending on where we think um, the issues are. And I think the minute you do hourly rate work, you're starting to have to have that discussion with clients and, and they may not be the best place people to make the decision um, on, on where the money should be spent. Some clients are great at it, some clients aren't. Um, so yeah, we just find it, it's simpler not to go down that path. Definitely takes the focus off the problem and it becomes this recurring question of how do I keep my costs in check every month? And a, yeah. a retainer model at the very outset says, this is the problem. We yeah. agree that this is the amount of money that we believe will help solve it. And let's just keep focused on the problem as opposed to nickel and diming each other every month. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, next model. Next one's an interesting one. This is performance pricing. So, so this is, for many years has been the holy grail for agencies. Um, people talk a lot of, at agency conferences about how we ought, to be preci- we ought to be pricing on performance. And what this basically means is that you go to the client and you say, look, we're only going to get paid uh, on success or we're going to be paid a certain percentage of success. So it might be for every sale that's made, um, the agency takes 10% or for every lead that comes in, we get a flat amount or, or percentage. It seems really clever and in many ways, you would think it's awesome because it ties the agency and the client together. The agency's, in effect, got skin in the game. Um, and there are certainly some types of campaigns for some clients where it, it really does make sense and it's a fantastic way to sell. Um, equally, it's not for everyone. We've done it historically. Um, yep. And every single time we've done it, it hasn't worked. I think there's the there's two things to that. I think one is, unless you're in an e-commerce environment, where you kind of almost moving into like an affiliate type model. So let's kind of put that to the side for a second. I've found that every time we've done it with a client in a lead gen kind of operation, B2B, anything that isn't transactional, you ultimately find that interests aren't aligned. Mm. Or if it's based on generate me more traffic, super easy for us to drive traffic, but that doesn't mean quality mm. rankings as ways for us to move rankings faster than we should or to get ranking on things that aren't necessarily of benefit to the business traffic traffic's cheap easy to move if it's even then you go we'll just do it to the lead level then it's all just lead volume as opposed to lead quality and the relationships we have 
with clients that are strongest are ones where we're sitting there working with them saying, let's, how do we sharpen up lead quality? These territories aren't working. These are, mm -hmm. um, and almost impossible to then to tie it to a performance type space. And then if, even if you get the lead stuff right, and we feel we're moving in the right direction, then it just becomes a sales issue, which is, well, we've led the horse to the water that we can't mm. force it to drink. And inevitably you will, we, it's just an outsourced way of ending up with the, the sales and marketing misalignment conversation. So I think for us, I'm yet to be proved that in any way, shape or form, unless it's transactional, can you actually make it work? I think some small yeah. bonuses on some things that um, objectively both parties are moving towards, but not necessarily the entire engagement can work. Um, and then if you look at, e-commerce well then you, you start to possibly be able to put some some metrics in place where both parties can move toward is that what you'd kind of agree with or? i think so. so so really what you're saying when it comes to lead gen campaigns it should be the cream on top if if someone's going to go down that path but not necessarily the whole thing i think that's right obviously not going to name names um but but some of the ways it's gone wrong for us in the past have been quite spectacular as well you know yeah. lengthy discussions um, with clients where there were genuinely highly metric driven campaigns um, and everyone got on the same page, everyone thought the deal was great, but the performance numbers in the end surprised everyone with where the money was going to go afterwards and it was obviously just a terrible misfit. Um, it did sell the relationship, um, which is a real shame when that happens. And I, I think even on the, the transactional e-com side of things, I, I don't think it's as cut and dry as, as a lot of people would like everyone to think as well. I, I see a couple of drawbacks. Firstly, and, and I think COVID has shown this, that we don't have endless supply and capacity. Um, and even when it comes to um, online retail, there's quality issues that come into play. So the agency can be doing an incredible job at driving a staggering number of leads. But if the online retailer runs out of supply um, or their supply chain breaks down in terms of delivery, um, or their customer service can't handle things in terms of fulfillment and they get bad reviews and that in turn um, destroys the future conversion rate, then the hard work of the agency where they've genuinely done an awesome job yeah. um, can mean significantly lower performance. That's it. And we're, we're not going to talk SEOs, uh, sorry, uh, guarantees on this podcast, but you then kind of start looking at um, there's certain tactics can be undertaken in SEO that aren't necessarily in the best long-term interests of the client. Yeah. So you end up looking at an agency potentially incentivized to take short-term tactics that aren't in the best interest of the, of the retailer over time. So yeah. um, we, because we've, we've been around for a long time now and don't necessarily like the the model that is heavily incentivized, I think a, a small bonus based on certain things happening can be a nice way to move people in a gentle direction and get people moving in the right direction, but otherwise probably, probably don't work so well. What, I, what I'm keen to move to now is to look at, to actually put some meat on the bone, look at core channels, look at mm. Google ads. I think that's a, a platform that lots of listeners are engaged in. Look at SEO, look at the different social platforms, and then talk a little bit more about creative design, email marketing, and what are some actual numbers or percentages that um, can actually give listeners some benefit to go, yeah, that's about right. That's what I'm seeing. Oh, we... I need to take this conversation back to to the to the board, to my manager, to the yep. CEO, to say we're actually not spending enough. Or conversely, hmm, interesting, maybe we are spending too much on that service. So, starting with Google Ads, obviously small businesses might be spending a couple of hundred bucks a month on actual media yeah. through to Google, through to businesses spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you know a good number of Australian retailers and brands spending you know into the seven figures each month. But how much should it cost to have? an agency run your Google ads in a, in a, in a good way. Yes. You want us to throw it all out there, James. Throw it out there, Dave. Come on. Okay. And, and can our listeners take this as a fixed quote they can take to their uh, decision makers for approval? I don't think so. I think let's just, let's just talk numbers and That's it. So let's say, okay, you're spending 10 grand a month on Google ads. How much should you, should you be paying an agency to manage it for you? Um, I'm not allowed to say it depends. No. Okay. Um, so it, it does depend, um, <laughs> like, uh, like I said at the beginning. But but if we were if we were looking at a, a, a pretty simple campaign, um, 10k of spend a month on, on Google Ads, then I think a reasonable starting point for for our pricing, how we approach things, you're going to be looking at starting probably around the three three and a half thousand dollar mark. If it's a really complex campaign, then you might be going up a little bit more than that. And what if I'm spending five grand a month? You're spending five grand a month on the media. Yep it's typically not going to make a lot of difference. There's a minimum amount um, that any agency is not going to go below. And even if you're only spending a dollar a month, 
there's a fair bit of work in simply understanding the campaign, um, ensuring that it's been streamlined properly and it's been one of a dollar probably. That was a that was a test. And you test was it passed it. That's right. I think like often that's a misconception, which is but hang on, I'm only spending five grand or I'm only spending three grand. Surely you can't charge me two, three, four grand to manage it. And it's like, well, unfortunately, if you want someone who's onshore, not necessarily that everyone who's good is onshore, but if you want someone who's onshore, you want an account manager that you, you, you pick up the phone to or send an email to and they respond and they actually know your business um, and you expect someone to be in there every week in the platform making changes, then, and you look at hourly rates of any professional service provider in any industry, not even digital in major cities in Australia these days, you are looking at a couple of hundred bucks being a pretty reasonable benchmark. Mm. And it's going to, it's going to add up and it is going to be three grand, four grand, five grand. Um, if we're moving through to 50 K of media, what am yeah. I spending with an agency? Yeah. So again, it depends on complexity and, and, and how hard it's going to be to, to spend that money um, with good fit prospects. Uh, once you're around that kind of spend, you're definitely going to be adding some kind of a media management um, component on yep. so typically you know you might be charged 9 10 12 sort of percent depends on the agency um, that'll go on top of that original base retainer and that's quite flexible so if the spending goes up in a particular month it obviously scales up the percentage um, and if it drops below the threshold um, and you're probably the best person to talk to what our thresholds uh, threshold yeah, i think that's right. it does it jumps around a little bit and when you're saying complexity um multi-region looking at um getting better integration into sales environments and lead quality scoring, those types of things will often impact complexity, yeah. um, a, a new campaign or a complete campaign rebuild versus, you know, we'll have clients that are, have been running Google ads for 10 years and we've been running them for four years and products and services aren't changing too much. And you are obviously um, still market driven and you're still at the mercy of changes that Google are making, but often those campaigns are simpler. I think that's right. Like I think for us, it's difficult for us to to work with a client where you don't have three, four K a month minimum for Google ads. Yep. That probably gets you to maybe 10 K, maybe 15 K of spend, maybe less, maybe more. Yep. But once you start getting past 30, 50, hundred K, you it's a media scale. You're looking at, as you said, 15%, some agencies, 12 others down to nine. Um, don't see too much low single digit media management in Google unless you're kind of spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and whatever else. So I think that's that's good. You've given us some some real numbers there, Dave. Um, yeah. And can I, just, can I just add to that? One of the one of the the nice things about where the agency or the digital services industries at the moment is that there are options for almost every price point and every level of complexity. But what you kind of give up is confidence. So there'll be people that have heard that price and go, wow, that's insanely cheap. And there'll be other people that hear that price and go, that is outrageous. How can they justify it? And I think it's important that listeners understand that what, what you're doing is you're buying confidence and you're buying expertise. So if you go to an agency like Rocket and there's a whole bunch of other great agencies um, in Australia as well, you know you're going to be handled well. You're going to have a, a, a genuine depth or breadth of experience and you're not just dealing with one person. You're going to pay for that. That costs money. Um, you can be really lucky if you're a startup, small media budget, you go out and find um, someone who's working on their own and they're fantastic at what they do, you can get a great experience for the fraction of the price. But what, what has to be factored in there is the risk. You are dealing with one person. They may not be what you think they are, or they may get sick, or they may take a job or, or, or whatever. So we certainly spoke well, about Or they might not be very good. Or they might not be very good. Exactly right. So so as you start paying more, some of it is for the ability for that agency to do better and more complex work. And some of it is simply insurance. So you end up knowing you're going to get work done at a certain standard um, and not below that. That's right. Um, SEO. SEO. So, full stop. One, one, one number. All right. I'm going to say for SEO <laughs> again, you're probably looking at a campaign that starts pretty similar around the three to three and a half thousand dollar mark. Um, the thing that makes too SEO cheap. Too, cheap. too cheap, too cheap, too yes. cheap. Put the price up. <laughs> um, what I was going to say though was that SEO is a bit different to paid search, in that SEO has an enormous number of different areas. And so, if we have a client that comes to us and they say, "Look, um, we've got great web devs, and they're doing all the coding changes in our website, and we already write great content," um, then that will limit the scope of the work we're doing for SEO. So we're effectively going to be a technical SEO agency for the client. We might be doing some uh, some link generation work for them as well, um, and, and just a bunch of general 
the strategy and making sure things are right doing the reporting. Um, but as with all things, the more services that get bolted on, um, the more the price goes up. And SEO is definitely an area where the price can go up quite a lot, depending on what's required. That, yeah, sorry, I cut you off. That's exactly right. Like I think it's um, if you're a small to medium sized business that just needs to have good technical on site SEO done and a little bit of link building, then there probably is agencies out there doing decent work at you know three, four, five grand. Yeah. But you know, if if you're a, first thing is strategy, right? There's businesses that probably don't actually need content being worked on all the time. Yeah. They've already got that solved somewhere else. But if you need a big content play, then how much does content cost? How long is it? Right. Doing three grand, five grand, ten grand a month. Yep. In house or with an agency. Um, if you if you're in a competitive space and haven't been doing link building over the last or offsite work over the last five years, and you're against banks or airlines or complex e-com, you've got catch up and you need a strategy which you could have multiple full-time employees working on that kind of stuff, or you could be using an agency for it. Um, but it seems to me that most well-established upper end of SME into mid-market, you are probably spending with an agency 4K, 5K, through to 10K for your kind of just technical SEO program, a lot spending more than that. And if you're below that mark and you're spending a couple of grand a month on SEO to tick, we're doing the SEO box, a couple of grand, 10 hours a month, two and a half hours a week. Is that really a marketing channel that you're taking very seriously? Um, you, you certainly wouldn't expect it to move the needle. And, and I think, again, the only exception is if the other elements are being taken care of internally or by another provider. Yep. Um, and we certainly see that. We certainly take on SEO campaigns where there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening well um, on, on their website and with their content, and we're just coming in for a particular purpose. Um, SEO, as you say, it's so complex and there's plenty of in-house teams that have large numbers of people just to run SEO. For the like, yeah, there's, there's businesses spending a couple of hundred grand a month on SEO, right? And then the reality is, is that, and I think that's something that needs to be um, addressed and realigned is that so common for us to have a client come along and say, I want to spend 50 grand a month on Google ads, or I have been spending 50 grand a month on Google ads, but then we'll balk at the idea of spending 10 grand a month on an SEO program. Yeah. Then you look into analytics and half their traffic is coming from SEO and 20% is coming from Google ads. And it's not all branded traffic coming through, through organic. And I think because it's this kind of misconception that the SEO industry has done itself such a disservice over the last 15 years of cheap, cheap, cheap package, package, it's actually devalued the channel and lift, you know, lift, lift above it all. And what problem am I trying to solve here or what value can be generated from a really strong organic program. And often you find that you should be spending comparable to, to what your media spend is. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, like, as we talked about before, the whole cookie cutter approach, I don't think there should be cookie cutter approaches for any of these channels, but if there was one channel where there should never be a cookie cutter approach, it's SEO. And ironically, it's the most, most package driven channel of all digital, right? Which is why it has such a horrible reputation out there. Yeah. And, and that's, and I don't know this is about pricing, but it's worth touching on that SEO has had a pretty bad reputation because it's been, I think, because it's a it's a channel that takes a long time to get results, and therefore it's easy for for less credible companies to come in and take retainer income without really producing a lot. And before the client knows what's going on, they've they've had a tidy earn out of it. So, so I'd say if you're looking at getting into your services and the company you're chatting to is not going to a lot of effort to understand what your problem is and what you're trying to achieve. Um, then you should run away pretty quickly. Yeah, that's it. Good. And sadly, it's the channel that drives the most traffic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the next one being social ads. So let's just talk to Facebook and Instagram, I guess, on one just on one side, and then we'll talk to LinkedIn on the other. But I think fundamentally pretty similar in terms of how and why they should be priced in a certain way. Um, but yeah, let's pretend I'm spending 15, 15 grand a month on running yeah. social advertising. Actually, let's not worry about Facebook and Insta versus LinkedIn. Like, what, what should I be spending with an agency? The, the first thing we'll do is take a bit of a step back um, and, and say, how good is your creative? Because I think when we're looking at SEO, there's an assumption there's going to be ongoing content, content creator and ongoing website changes done. Um, page search, it's pretty simple with creative. You need a good landing page, obviously, and decent ads, um, but often landing pages exist and you're really doing a lot of work in the channel. Yep. Paid social is an empty vessel unless you have fantastic creative. Um, it's as simple as that. So if a client comes to us and says, yeah, I want to run some paid Facebook campaigns, 
um, and we have a look at their website and it's not so great and we have a look at their creative assets and they're not so great, then they have a potentially very expensive problem to solve because they need great content if they're going to have any kind of impact when it comes to the paid social space. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do totally. And I think it's 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 an interesting one where we talked briefly when we we're talking Google ads that it's the opposite of the old billboard at the airport, which is you actually almost want to pay your service provider more because they're going to get you more value in terms of optimization and tweaks, whatever else. Paid social takes that to the next level, which is we've had so many clients over the years who kind of say that's ridiculous. I want my 30K of media to go into Facebook, not into creative. Mm. But it's no exaggeration that your 30k can get 1k versus value or 100k versus value yeah. on, on nothing else than the creative that is used yeah. so it's definitely one where it's not about the media buy it's about what you're putting into market yeah that's it and, and this is one of these good areas where i find that should be an easy discussion to have um with people higher up who are making decisions on budget if you're an in-house marketer everyone uses Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn um, or, or something, everyone has their poison, go into that channel next time and have a look at what gets your attention. Um, lazy, stale, creative uh, is not that. Um, it's so easy to make uh, make the case to say, unless we have great creative, let's just not waste our time. Yeah. So stripping creative out, um, it's interesting, like we have a creative team um, at Rocket and they are doing creative for... I don't know, what the, maybe 60, 65% of the campaigns that we're running in social. Hmm. Well, then for some of our clients, they'll have creative agencies in place or we'll be working with them and we're, we're placing the media and driving performance and the creative agency is responsible for creative. And then for certain clients, they're doing creative in-house. So let's take creative out of it yeah. for a second. Just the actual typical media management, I'm spending 20K a month on, on my, my paid social. What should I be paying an agency to manage it? Yeah, it's, it's not too different to, to paid search once you take out the creative. So you're probably looking at a starting point of about $3,000 a month. Um, and and it's, it's what you would expect. It's setting the campaigns up so the creative exists, but getting it into the, into the, the appropriate platform. Um, it's making sure it's working nicely and optimised. It's reviewing it. Um, it's making small tweaks as you kind of learn things about how the campaign's going and setting up testing and those sorts of things. So, again, the effort that the agency goes to in those retainer hours should have a significant impact on performance. Um, and we sort of see with paid social, it's an interesting channel. If you just set and forget, you'll get um, diminishing returns surprisingly quickly. Um, creative does fatigue and campaigns do fatigue. So yeah, it's a matter of getting in there. And all, I think every three, four, five months, probably five being too long, but yeah, two, three, four months, that's generally what we're, and that, that is why it does become a more expensive channel to run because then you're having to drop fresh creative in. Um, I think that the point there also that you're spending 100K a month in LinkedIn or in, in Facebook, you, you are then looking at your 12%, 10%, 8% on top of creative, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. And then you, paid, creative, paid social does get pretty complex when you are then running Instagram, Facebook, potentially running LinkedIn if you're in a B2B environment and once again all those complexities around multinational you know putting buckets of leads tier one tier two tier three integrating into salesforce hubspot type stuff so your price will jump around depending on what your agency is being expected to do yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and again you know it's probably not as complex as seo to quote creative aside but you still want your agency uh or an agency you're thinking about working with you still want them to go to a fair bit of effort before they give you a price to make sure they genuinely understand the ecosystem as well. Like where does it fit into your company and who will they be dealing with and what are approval is going to be like and um, and how where, where are we sending traffic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's a complex picture and you want a, a proper proposal. That's it. The idea of, you know, one post a week, two posts a week, three posts a week for different pricing on a package is really unlikely to solve your, your actual business problem, right? Yeah, so that's it. It ticks a box. If you've got a boss that's KPI driven, they want to, they want to see you know, one ad being run every three months, then yeah, go to the cookie cutter approach. But if you're trying to trying to solve the actual business problem and get leads or sales below a certain price, then you've got to be pretty strategic. Um, and the next two points are broader than the other three, or I think it is easy to throw some numbers around, but creative and design without getting into the different models and retainer versus project, et cetera, but roughly yeah. what you're seeing out there and then email marketing and automation, how that's kind of working for businesses. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so if we're talking about pure creative, there's a couple of ways that it can happen. Some agencies are going to package that up in the retainer. So as an example, quite often in our paid social campaigns, will include a certain amount of creative or tweaks to creative or even editing of existing creative to make it work for that platform. Um, so you can often expect to see that in the retainer. But typically when you've got brand new creative being worked on, particularly when it's complex or involves new ideas, then agencies will often just give you a quote um, for the specific piece of creative. And it can be anything, you know. So let's say we're talking about a landing page for a, for a particular campaign. Um, you can see agencies uh, building up nice landing pages for a, a couple of grand right through to um, easily seeing agencies charging sort of ten to $20,000. And again, it depends on the work that's being put into it. You've you, you got your models. You've got an agency on a retainer or you're paying them for a scope of work. And I think generally it is hallmarks again, wanting an agency to sit down, what problem are we trying to solve here? And we believe we can solve it with this and this is the price. I think the only area where you might be okay to take a, a rack rate is on things like a set of remarketing ads or a set of social ads or a landing page once you're working with an agency that does understand your problem. It does become a bit easier. And that's the key there, isn't it? I think if, if you do have a rack rate price um, for some of those assets, that's fine if the creative exists. But if the team's got to go off and come up with the creative concept, um, get it approved by the decision makers, potentially get photography done or, or video done or, or animation work done, um, let alone the in-house design work, then, then that price can be highly variable and, and should be. But once that core concept has been signed off, um, repurposing it for different things absolutely is it's getting closer to a commodity activity. Email marketing and automation? Okay, email marketing and automation. I almost don't much. want you to give a number here because I think the solution is not a number. Yeah, that's it. I, I don't have a particular number for this. So I'm not sure if you've got one you can throw at us. Yeah, there isn't one. And that's the reality. I think that's the... The bit that businesses are they kind of they're almost trying to ram automation into the same model of retainer work. Yeah. And it's just not how automation platforms work, where it is so contingent on what your business is doing, how your sales and marketing environments are operating, um, email cadence, reporting, all those types of things. I think it is actually a totally different kettle of fish. Yeah, that's it. I think that's really fair. I think that's really fair. And it's probably we I don't think we've touched on this too much, but one of the when we're looking at a, at a prospect and trying to figure out what sort of a client they're going to be, one of the one of the things that we assess closely is how many existing campaigns do they have in the area that we're looking at working at them, um, in how mature are those campaigns, how successful are they, and and if we're seeing positives everywhere, then we suddenly feel a lot more comfortable about what the future is going to look like. So I'm not saying the work's easier, but I'm saying we know how they've gone with a certain amount of effort, and we know how much better they can go when we put more effort in, and we can price it more accurately and more cost effectively. But when you look at things like automation and emails, when someone has no track record there at all, it can be a huge amount of work to get them going the first time. And I actually feel if you've scoped it well, then a project's great because it can give certainty to both sides. But I do feel that often, particularly in the infancy, hourly rate model actually doesn't work too badly in this space. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It just gives actually a, a clearer idea and it's, it's almost more just how far are we going here and yep. rather than time, time-based? Uh, yep. Yeah, great. Period of time. Um, that's been awesome. I'm glad I pushed you. I think we've got some real numbers there for the, for the listeners. Mm. One bit of advice. I always like to finish the pod with one question. So what's the leading piece of advice that you would give to in-house marketers when they're going out to market and looking at price and price for the services that they need? Yeah, it'll be be careful what you incentivize. So if, if you decide to go down that performance model, then just be aware that you're probably only incentivizing short-term activities and short-term actions, whereas we know um, through experience that often it's the long-term brand building activities that are absolutely essential to future and to, to success in six or 12 months time. And, um, and, and likewise with the media management one, if you go down that path, you're incentivizing potentially an agency just to spend more money on media. So the incentive should always be the one that helps the agency um, solve your key business problem. That's ultimately the only thing that matters. So incentivizing that way. Love it. Awesome. Good stuff. Dave, you've done very well on your first, first try of the Smarter Marketer podcast. We may even get you back. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, James.